Theatre, we have the final part of our movie premiere about a boy coming up in just half an hour. First on ITV1 with Wednesday's latest news, we join Nicholas Owen. Street by street, the dramatic battle to take Fallujah. Intense fighting has left the Americans occupying most of the rebel city. British forces have been under fire. We have our eyewitness report of attacks on Camp Dogwood. Also tonight, stub it out, the Scots are told. Will the whole UK get a smoking ban? American interest rates rise. We investigate the consequences for us. And blue moments have Chelsea knocked Newcastle out of the Carling Cup. And in the Midlands tonight, a mother's praised her son after he killed the man she says raped her. Mark Big from Shropshire is facing three years in youth custody. Good evening. Most of Fallujah is tonight occupied, though not controlled, by American forces. The fight is far from over. They still face pockets of resistance, fierce ones. Today, the Iraqi military said it had found what it called hostage slaughterhouses in the city. One U.S. general said it would take two more days to capture Fallujah. Today, American forces closed in from all directions. They claim to have taken 70% of the city, including Highway 10, the main east to west route through Fallujah. Paul Davis has today's developments. We're going in, we're taking the city this time. We're taking the city. No idle boast, two thirds of Fallujah is tonight in American hands. But it's been achieved the hard way. Close combat is rarely witnessed in modern day conflict. These remarkable images sent back by journalists embedded with the Marines tell a story just about as far away from the clinical long-range warfare the Americans would prefer to wage as it's possible to be. Here, every house in every street has to be taken and the Marines come under fire from militants they can't see. When an enemy gun position is spotted in one of the many shell-scarred buildings, tanks are brought up. This firefight in the Jolan district lasted more than seven hours, but at the end of it, another block had been gained. I want to keep pushing up. I want to keep pushing up, the officer says, but the swift progress of this operation has been at a cost. Even before today's street battles, 10 American soldiers had been killed, more than 40 Marines and their Iraqi allies injured. The wounded evacuated under fire as the advance continued. There are no accurate figures on the number of militants dead or civilian casualties. Here, a group of people waving white flags and claiming to be civilians walked away from another firefight. The Marines are still meeting fierce resistance from insurgents who appear to be firing from Fallujah's historic mosques. We're taking fire from the mosques directly south of us. The ones we can see, yeah? The big one right there. Iraqi troops who've been fighting alongside the Americans may now be asked to enter the mosques and take on the insurgents. Earlier, they were pictured raising the Iraqi flag over a recaptured police headquarters. Iraqi officials say their soldiers have also taken a building used until recently to hold and slaughter hostages. The hostage takers may be on the run, they are still defiant. Tonight they released this video, said to show 20 Iraqi soldiers they've taken prisoner in Fallujah. The prisoners have their backs to the camera. There's no way of knowing if this is a stunt or proof the extremists have just acquired a human shield. Paul Davis, ITV News. The assault on Fallujah has taken on a very sinister significance for the Iraqi interim Prime Minister Iyad Alawi. Three members of his family have been kidnapped. The hostage takers say they'll be beheaded unless US forces pull out of Fallujah and rebel prisoners are freed. 
British troops south of Fallujah came under serious attack again today. An Army Air Corps pilot is fighting for his life. He was hit by insurgent bullets fired at his helicopter during a flight between Camp Dogwood and Baghdad. On the ground, another of the Black Watch was injured by a rocket attack on the camp. Julian Mannion is there tonight. As the battle for Fallujah goes on, it's been a day of repeated insurgent attacks in and around Camp Dogwood that has left two British servicemen injured. A day that has shown that the hidden enemy around this camp is well organized and determined to do the British harm. The rebels' first target was a pair of British helicopters flying from Camp Dogwood back to their base in the south. Insurgent rifle fire hit one of them, seriously injuring the pilot. The co-pilot managed to bring the damaged Lynx helicopter safely back to Dogwood. Soon afterwards, an American medevac chopper touched down in a cloud of red smoke next to the camp clinic. And the pilot, still fighting for his life, was carefully put on board for the flight to Baghdad. But even as the Black Hawk raced away at low level, insurgent gunners had Camp Dogwood in their sights. Out of nowhere, a volley of rockets slammed into the camp and exploded. Troops took cover, but one of the four rockets injured a British serviceman. Three hours later, more rockets whistled in. As a rocket landed outside, we took cover in the derelict building reinforced with sandbags that is home to journalists at Camp Dogwood. The sirens are wailing again as Camp Dogwood comes under rocket fire for the second time today. In the first attack, one British serviceman was injured as a rocket plowed into the helicopter landing pad. At the moment, we don't know what's happened out there. We heard two impacts, but there are no reports of casualties or damage. There were no serious injuries in the second attack. Today, the commander of the Black Watch had ordered a drill to test camp security. By the time the day was over, everyone here knew that the threat was real. Julian Mannion, ITV News at Camp Dogwood, Iraq. The dangers faced by British troops in Iraq was brought home to the Prime Minister today. A wreath of poppies in memory of those soldiers killed there since the start of the war on Saddam Hussein was laid on the steps of Number 10 by their families. One father said they'd done it because the blame lies at the doorstep of Downing Street. Well, let's go live to Downing Street now and our senior political correspondent, John Ray. John, um, how much of a problem do you think it is for Tony Blair, this group, well, the laying of that wreath was certainly a powerful, symbolic act, Nick. It was also a day here of great emotion and great anger. The parents describing the war variously as immoral, illegal, an act of lunacy. Now, their grief has turned them into uh, the most potent weapons that the anti-war campaigners have got. Against that, Mr Blair can simply argue that Iraq in the long run will be worth it. And to walk away now as the parents want to withdraw troops would simply be to abandon Iraq to a much worse fate. Now, the polls show that just about most people are with Mr Blair on that point so what only the only thing that really unites all sides this week remembrance week is the fear of what sacrifices British troops may yet have to make and uh, the Prime Minister is heading to Washington tomorrow, isn't he, for a meeting with George Bush. What's he hoping to achieve? Well, Downing Street have been quietly playing up expectations of this meeting. When people talk about payback for Mr Blair, they talk about the President uh, putting more muscle into the Middle East peace process. Uh, a statement of intent is what Number 10 said they were looking for from President Bush. Tonight, Nick, they got that from the President, saying that the end of the Arafat era signaled the beginning of a new era of hope in the Middle East. There will be an opening for peace when leadership uh, of the Palestinian people steps forward and says, help us build a democratic and free society. And uh, when that happens, and I believe it's going to happen, because I believe all people desire to live in freedom, uh, the United States of America will be more than willing to help build the institutions necessary for a free society to emerge so that the Palestinians can have their own state. You will note there the commitment again to a Palestinian state, but there are many, many, many people, Nick, who will say, frankly, the Prime Minister will come back with nothing more useful than those kind of sound bites. John, thank you. 
Well, as John was mentioning, with Yasser Arafat's life slipping away, it seems the somewhat undignified wrangle over his burial has finally ended. The ground is now being prepared in his West Bank compound in Ramallah. Well, Juliet Bremner is outside his hospital in Paris now. Um, Juliet, what's the latest on Yasser Arafat? Well, there is now a sense that we're waiting for the inevitable, Nick. Everyone here knows that Yasser Arafat is dying. It's a question of when confirmation of that will come. His dire predicament was underlined today by his close friend and senior Muslim cleric, Tazin al-Tamini, who spent most of the day at his bedside reciting verses of the Quran. He just came out tonight from the hospital and he said to us that Mr. Arafat's breathing is still normal and he saw his shoulder move three times. He said under such circumstances they couldn't contemplate removing life support. However, Mr. Arafat's life is natural slipping away. The, the Palestinian foreign minister said today that both his liver and kidneys had failed, which means that only his heart and lungs are still functioning, and those with the help of a machine. And when he does die, what happens then? Well, we do know that funeral preparations are now well underway. Egypt said today that his funeral will be held in Cairo. And there are signs outside his shattered headquarters in Ramallah today that they're preparing for a burial place. The Israelis have agreed it wouldn't have been the first choice of the Palestinians. However, it is the place he was held as a virtual prisoner for the last three and a half years. So perhaps it'll be a fitting memorial. Juliet in Paris, thank you. Pubs and restaurants in Scotland should become smoke-free zones in 18 months' time. Today, the Scottish Cabinet, in its most significant decision so far, voted for a ban on smoking in enclosed public places. There isn't one anywhere else in the UK yet. The idea is to cut smoking-related disease and improve the health of the nation. Well, Martin Geisler is in a smoke-filled pub in Glasgow tonight. This is a no-compromise ban. In 18 months' time, it'll be a crime to light up in any pub, club or restaurant anywhere in Scotland. A big deal and a big day for devolution. After all the criticism, Scotland's politicians have shown they are prepared to make controversial decisions out of step with Westminster. Even some smokers here will raise a glass to that. A good night out in a Scottish pub. Smokers here are in the minority, but it's getting up everyone's nose. The warnings on passive smoke are clear. Today, Scotland's politicians called time. It will be a comprehensive ban, and a comprehensive ban will be a clear signal that Scotland has changed. It will reduce smoking, it will save lives, and it will help transform our national health. Health experts say it's a massive breakthrough in the fight to rid Scotland of its reputation as the sick man of Europe. I've been practicing medicine in the National Health Service now for 25 years, and I can honestly say I think this is the most important public health step forward in my career. There will be a political backlash. Publicans have promised that, warning the new law will kill business. At least 30% of your customers who come into the pub actually smoke. Um, and if those 30% choose not to come in because there's a smoking ban, that um, means paying people off, it means that your business is, is devastated. But should licensees in England and Wales share those fears? John Reid, the health secretary, is due to publish a long-awaited white paper on the subject next week. It will include restrictions on smoking in public places, but may fall short of a full ban. Government thinking is that driving smokers out of pubs and into their homes may not be a good idea. This advert reminds us of the dangers of passive smoking among children. What's more, Dr Reid doesn't want to alienate traditional Labour voters. Sometimes, as my mother would put it, people from those lower social economic categories have very few pleasures in life, and one of them they regard as smoking. In Scotland, the decision is made, but the debate continues. If people want to smoke, then they can, but I don't want to inhale their passive smoke, you know, so... Pubs, drink and fags go together. <laughs> but not for much longer. Come spring 2006, doing this in Scotland will be a criminal offence. Martin Geisler, ITV News, Glasgow. <laughs> It's been day two of the New Year shooting murder trial and the prosecution lawyer outlined the possible motives for the killing of Charlene Ellis and Letitia Shakespeare. He said they were innocently caught up in a feud based on revenge, reprisal and rivalry. Five men are on trial for their murder. Geraint Vincent was in court. 
Shot dead while standing in an alleyway outside a New Year's party, it is the prosecution's case that Charlene Ellis and Letitia Shakespeare were the victims of a drive-by shooting, which was well planned, but botched. Timothy Raggett QC told Leicester Crown Court this morning that this was an operation intended to kill, and that was its plain intention. It may not have been the desired consequence that Letitia and Charlene died, but the fact that the defendants clearly desired to kill someone is almost beyond question. The someone or some people concerned, we suggest, are likely to have been their rivals. In the Aston area of Birmingham, says the prosecution, there has been a culture of street gangs, one called the Burger Bar and one called the Johnson Crew. The men charged with the girl's murder were members of the Burger Bar, and when they fired the shots into the group of people, which included Charlene and Letitia, their actual targets were members of the Johnson crew. This trial has heard that the motive for the attack could have been revenge for the murder four weeks earlier of this man, Johan Martin. He was the brother of one of the defendants in this case, Nathan Martin. Charlene and Letitia were described in court today as close friends who went out together all the time. They were in no sense, said the prosecution, a part of Birmingham's gang culture, but in every sense, the victims of it. Geraint Vincent, ITV News, Leicester. Around 100 British troops are on standby to go to the Ivory Coast to help rescue British nationals. Mobs there have been targeting foreign citizens after violence erupted between French peacekeepers and local forces. American interest rates were nudged up again this evening by another a quarter of one percentage point. The Federal Reserve Bank agrees the economy is looking healthier, especially in terms of jobs. The real worry, economists say, is America's huge and growing budget deficit. Robert Moore in the United States has more details. The nation's central bank just voted to raise interest rates a quarter point and... This is the fourth interest rate rise this year. It's not a surprise, but it brings into focus the state of the U.S. economy just as the president ponders his second term. we still got work to do. Mr. Bush's entry is filling up with memos about how to accelerate America's economic growth and how to tackle the huge budget and trade deficits. Some economists are already warning of a major challenge ahead. We're steering towards a cliff of a real financial crisis uh, due to the combination of large household debt, large budget deficits, and large trade deficits. And that will unravel at some point, either through a real financial crisis or through prolonged slow growth for the future. America has by far the largest economy in the world. It's the engine for global growth. And that's one reason why the trade deficit matters so much. And just look at the figures. When George Bush came to power four years ago, he inherited a massive trade surplus of $236 billion. But by 2002, the U.S. was importing more than it exported, and today the country's trade deficit is a record $422 billion. But amid that serious problem of growing deficits, the Bush administration is pointing to improving employment and export figures, suggesting, they say, the American economy is rapidly gaining strength. But what impact is that having on the British economy and on world growth? Well, we asked one British economist. The US economy is still likely to grow at a good three, three and a half percent over the course of the next year or so, and that provides a good solid base for world growth in general. But European exporters, including those well-known British brands, are struggling in America for another reason, the exchange rate. We export some 15% of our total exports to the United States. But the dollar has been weakening uh, for, for some time now, and consequently that makes our exports slightly more expensive, and therefore we can tend to lose market share if we're not careful. The dollar's problems stem from that huge trade gap and budget deficit. And another stress on this energy-hungry economy is the fact that oil prices remain so high. Robert Moore, ITV News, Washington. That interest rate decision didn't trouble U.S. financial markets. They're expecting another in December. The Dow closed down less than a point at 10,385. Here, the FTSE, the main measure of shares in London, closed up 16.8 points at 4,734, despite a fall in shares in Vodafone, who today launched their third-generation mobile phone services. Their price closed down 2 pence to 137.75 pence. Now, with tonight's main sports news, here's Felicity. 
Thank you, Nick. Jose Mourinho's Chelsea are through to the quarterfinals of the Carling Cup. They beat Newcastle at St James's Park, but it took two goals in extra time to seal the victory. Alex Thomas reports. Alan Shearer and John Terry leading out Newcastle and Chelsea, England internationals past and present. Clearly these two clubs couldn't afford to copy Arsenal and Manchester United by fielding weakened teams. But despite the first choice players on show, much of the early action was second rate. Scoring chances were rare, although Chelsea's goalkeeper Carlo Cudicini was the busiest. But if Newcastle threatened more in the first half, they were forced back after the break. Oh, he's missed a great chance for Chelsea. Thiago should have put Chelsea ahead. His manager couldn't believe it. So no goals after 90 minutes, but Jose Mourinho's mood was lifted in extra time. First Ida Gudjonsson broke the deadlock. And then Dutch winger Ian Robin clinched a 2-0 victory for Chelsea with this brilliant solo goal. Can he go all the way through? You bet he can! Alex Thomas, Absolutely ITV News. Elsewhere, Liverpool players and fans paid their respects to Emlyn Hughes ahead of tonight's game against Middlesbrough. Hughes, who died yesterday aged 57, played more than 650 matches for Liverpool and won almost every honour in the game. He was affectionately known as Crazy Horse by the Liverpool fans. And these are the results of all of tonight's Carling Cup games. Liverpool beat holders Middlesbrough, Neil Mellor scoring both goals. Manchester United were 2-0 winners over Crystal Palace. And Fulham recovered from a goal down to try and 4-2 after extra time at the city ground. And you can see all those goals on ITV1 at 11.35 tonight. It was also League Cup night in Scotland where Rangers met Celtic in an extraordinary game. John Hartson putting Celtic ahead, but with just five minutes remaining, Rangers came back. Dado Perso, the scorer, and then in extra time, Shoto Avaladze scored the winner to send Rangers through to the semi-finals. And in the night's other Scottish League Cup quarter-final, Hearts beat Dunfermline 3-1. Jason Robinson has described being awarded the England captaincy as one of the biggest moments of his life. The former rugby league star is standing for Johnny Wilkinson for all three autumn tests and his first job is to stop England's decent, recent run of five defeats in six matches. No, as I say, I'm excited. Um, you know, I have an opportunity that I, I, I never dreamed of before um, and I'm, I'm hoping to, um, you know, to do well in that role. As I say, this, we've got some great players around us, um, some players that are of very good form. So um, I'm just looking forward to Saturday and, and leading the team out to hopefully what we, will be um, you know, a good game for us. And that is tonight's sports, Nick. Thank you, Felicity. Join me again in a few minutes when I'll have a reminder of our headlines and a preview of some of tomorrow's newspapers. Now it's time to link up again with ITV newsrooms around the country for what's been going on where you are. Good evening, you're watching Central News, I'm Bob Warman. A teenager has been jailed for three years for killing a neighbour after his mother claimed he raped her. Mark Bick faces three years in youth custody for striking the alleged rapist on the head with a cricket bat. Keith Wilkinson reports. I was crying and crying and they took me downstairs to a separate room. I regret that it's my son that did it, but I've got, I've got no regrets that he's dead. The reaction of Yvonne Beek after her son was given three years in custody for manslaughter. Tonight, 17-year-old Mark Beek's life is in tatters after a split second of anger. He struck neighbour Derek Duffett with a single blow to the head and later he died of his injuries. The attack happened soon after Mark heard his mum make allegations that Mr Duffett had raped her here in the outhouse at her home in Newport, Shropshire. She makes no secret of her views about the man who died. I'm glad he's dead. I really do. Are you very pleased that he's dead? Yes. When Mark heard the allegations his mum was making in the house, he came here to this outhouse, took out a cricket bat, went down the road to confront the neighbour, got him to come back to speak to his mother. Now, he obviously wasn't happy with the explanation, followed him over there, there was something of an argument, he then struck him on the head. I'm proud of him. 
and fairs. The judge, Sir Richard Tucker, said he must give a sentence that reflected society's concern that violence could never be justified as a reason for resolving such matters. Friends of Mr Dovett said he should have got a longer sentence. Very good friend of Derek's, and I know he wasn't a rapist, I'm sorry he wasn't. You know, people say we should get the scum off the streets, he wasn't the scum. He's got three years, where's the justice in that? And there isn't, there's no justice, I'm very... Well, I feel sick. James Burbage, defending, said Mark Bick had lost his self-control and after being taunted and during a period of high emotion struck him just once, he said it was not as an act of revenge. I'd hate to think that if he'd have survived and he'd have come out, he might have raped a 14, 15-year-old girl when he was high on drugs. So I've got no regrets in that way. Friends of Derek Duffett say he certainly didn't deserve to die. Mark Bick says he didn't intend to kill him. A tragic case that's ended one life and wrecked another. Keith Wilkinson, Central News. Well, next tonight, a murder trial has been told. Revenge, reprisal and rivalry were the three motives behind the murder of teenage friends Charlene Ellis and Letitia Shakespeare. The girls were, say the prosecution, the innocent victims in a planned attack by a group of men on a rival gang. Eric McInnes has been covering the case. In tonight's Central News virtual court briefing, the latest on day two, the prosecution case. Today, the prosecution fleshed out the bones of its argument. Timothy Raggett QC said the clear motives of the murderers were revenge, reprisal and rivalry aimed by one gun gang against another. What other purpose, he added, would anyone have to carry a machine gun and two automatic pistols and use them on a crowd? Raggett then went on to describe the defendants, who we cannot show for legal reasons, including Marcus Ellis, known as E-Man, who is the half-brother of Charlene and Sophie Ellis. But the prosecution say he was related by blood, but barely anything else. Four others are accused of murder, including Nathan Martin, known as 23. The prosecution claim he and his co-accused set out to kill the sixth defendant, Jermaine Carty, who was from the rival gang, the Johnson Crew. The prosecution say the motive was revenge for the killing of Nathan's brother, Johan Martin, who was shot dead just a month before the girls. The stepson of a pub landlord who was battered to death has been jailed for life together with two other men. Michael Hughes, who lived at the Royal Oak pub at Pelsall in Warsaw, was struck eight times by one of the gang as he lay in his bed in April of last year. The three men stole a safe containing just over 1,500 pounds in order to fund their drug addiction. The jury in the trial of a world champion Kenyan athlete accused of rape has been discharged after failing to reach a verdict. 800 meter runner Billy Concella is alleged to have attacked a woman while she was asleep at a flat in Coventry in November last year. Concella's in custody tonight while the prosecution considers pressing for a retrial. Travellers have failed in their bid to set up camp on the edge of a village. Eleven families moved on to land at Eckington in Worcestershire in May. Witchhaven District Council issued enforcement notices, which they challenged, but a government inspector has thrown out their claim and ordered them to leave within five months. Plans have been announced to cut the number of fire engines on call during the night. The West Midlands Service wants to reduce the number of tenders at stations in Birmingham, Coventry and the Black Country from 62 to 47. The Fire Brigade's union has warned the cuts could cost lives. Hunt protester Otis Ferry has been named the second most eligible bachelor in the country. The son of rock star Brian Ferry from the South of Shropshire Hunt stormed Parliament in a pro-hunting demonstration in September. Well now, here's Charlie with the weather. Central weather with BMIBaby.com. 
Hi there, flipping cold outside tonight, particularly around rural parts, getting down as low as three or four Celsius. Towns just a smidge higher, but I should think a widespread frost. Essentially clear skies, and that should show us the early part anyway, some brightness tomorrow morning, but cloud really the order of the day. It's going to be thickening from the northwest all the way through the morning by lunchtime. Uh, most parts looking fairly grey, some of that cloud thick enough to drop bits of drizzle as through the day as well. Never horrendous, just grey and grizzly and feeling cool again and same sort of grey grizzly look to the place on Friday less cold uh, Saturday at the moment looking fairly pleasant bye bye <laughs> essential weather with bmibaby.com the airline with tiny fares and that's just about it for this evening our next bulletin at half past six tomorrow morning with Auntie Halai now though it's time to rejoin Nicholas Owen for the rest of the ITV news from the central news good night Hello again, a reminder of tonight's top stories. American troops have fought their way into the center of Fallujah. US generals say they now hold 70% of the city. Smoking in Scottish pubs and restaurants is to be banned in 18 months' time. The Scottish cabinet voted for that today. And President Bush has said the now imminent death of Yasser Arafat may provide a fresh opportunity for peace in the Middle East. Let's look now at the front pages of some of tomorrow's newspapers. The Guardian's main story is about Conservative Party plans to allow fathers more paternity leave. It has a picture of one of the soldiers killed in Iraq shown at the demonstration of family and friends in Downing Street. Lest we forget is the Daily Mail's headline. It shows a wreath placed on the doorstep of 10 Downing Street by the families of those soldiers killed in Iraq. On Remembrance Day, the Independent pictures soldiers killed in Iraq over the last year who add to the toll of British troops killed in conflicts. And the Scotsman has that story about the historic smoking ban in Scotland. It reports that smokers will be fined £100 if they light up in public places. That's it tonight. Next on the ITV News Channel... That is completely wrong, and I think it's just another example of his shabby opportunism. Prime Minister's questions from earlier today. I'll be back with tomorrow's lunchtime news. If you can, do join me at 12.30. From the team here, good night. ITV National Weather, sponsored by Powergen. Hello again, good evening. Well, a chilly night for many of us, but turning dull throughout the day tomorrow. And we can see those chilly conditions across central areas of the country tonight. Temperatures dropping down to around 2 Celsius, so the chance of a touch of frost. Elsewhere, towards the northwest, it'll be a milder night as cloud and rain works its way in there. Looking ahead to tomorrow morning, it's going to be quite a bright start, I think, for more southern and eastern parts elsewhere. More in the way of that cloud filtering through. And we are going to see some drizzly conditions across the western parts, and also more persistent rain towards the north if that cold front starts to work its way in. Quite a blast day tomorrow as well. Looking ahead to the end of the week, here's the position of that frontal system giving quite a dreary end to the week for many southern parts. Elsewhere looking brighter, also rather showery, turning wintry over higher ground. Good night. Positive energy from PowerGen. Well, the best bit still to come in the final part of tonight's movie premiere about a boy is next.